Hey, it's Dr. Phil, but then you knew that. Let's fill in the blanks, and today I'm speaking with a good friend of mine, one of the most recognizable and influential culinary stars in the world, Guy Fieri. Now, he is a chef, restaurateur, New York Times best-selling author, Emmy Award-winning TV host, and a very generous philanthropist. In 2019, Guy received a star on the celebrated Hollywood Walk of Fame, a rare feat for a chef. I mean, come on. On land and at sea, from Las Vegas Strip to the Atlanta City Boardwalk, from South Africa to Colombia, and from Costa Rica to Dubai, Guy's culinary creations and spirits are enjoyed globally every day. Now, he's not a fancy kind of chef. You're not going to see him with, like, the buttoned-up white thing and the big fluffy hat. He first showed up to compete as a chef on the Food Network. Everybody else was buttoned up that way, but not him. I think he showed up in a motorcycle jacket and had forgotten to comb his uh, hair, which I think he still forgot to do. But he has a passion for food. He has a passion for people. And he has a passion for creating an experience around food. He's been doing it since he was 12 years old. He's from Northern California, a little town called Ferndale. He'll tell you why you should know that town. You've probably seen it and don't know it. It was made very famous in a movie, but he's been at this a long time. You can call him a chef. I call him a people person, and I also call him a good friend. So let's talk to Guy Fieri. Guy? What's up, buddy? Hey, there you are. How you been, man? I'm all right. How about you? You know, same stuff, different day. Yeah. Hot, fast, and out of control. Yeah. I don't think you have two days alike ever. <laughs> I think we're probably correct on that one. Yeah. How have you been? I've been good, man. And yourself? It seems like you're just about as busy as uh, everybody else is. Where do I find you today? I'm in Northern California, up in the, up in the wine country. Yeah. So I, just, I just got back. I've been on a little bit of a tour. I was... Uh, doing some charity gigs and shooting some triple D and you know, you name it. Yeah. My God. Well, listen, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, it's all cause it's you boss. Just so you know, I was watching a show with you the other day and it's so funny cause I don't watch a lot of TV, but you had me sucked in on it so bad. And right at the end of the goddamn show, you went to the second piece. It was about the guy that was getting catfished from the girl that, uh, that had, you know, that you went to all the different towns she was supposedly living in the money and the whole thing and the cute girl and the the 60-year-old dude that was, I don't know if you, I mean, I don't know if you remember any episodes of like me, someone saying about Triple D, but I'm not kidding you, brother. It was so good. And my wife was sitting there laughing at me. She goes, to the guy that doesn't watch TV, you're just, you're just sucked into this. I'm like, would you find out when the second piece of this is coming out? I want to see how this ends. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that one. Aren't those tragic, though? How blind can they be to life to see all this? And yet, you know, I, I don't know. Love is, I guess they say, it, love is blind, right? Logic stands no chance against love. Or lust. Yeah, that's for sure. That was a great show, though. It was yeah. a great show. Well, I, lo thank I love you. what you do. I love what you do. Listen, I got to ask some questions about something I know you are really passionate about. And we're... Fortunately, starting to come out of this pandemic, but you've got more involvement in the food industry and the restaurant industry. We'll talk about the television part of it in a minute, but what in the world did this do to the restaurant industry for this two years? They rallied around the airline industry, but man, they were sure slow coming to the support of the restaurant industry. What did it do to these people for two years shutting everything down? Well, it's so funny that you use the airline industry as, a, as an example. And I, I'm happy that anybody was supported. I mean, you, sure. you know it. You're a, you're a frontline guy. You're aware of got your finger on the pulse. Um, the, the airline industry is owned by a lot of big people with a lot of big money and a lot of big, a lot of big unification. And the restaurant industry isn't as unified. as Although we're all brothers and sisters of the business, and most everybody loves each other and wants to help each other, there's an organization, the National Restaurant Association, which is kind of the biggest voice we have. But otherwise, it's a bunch of individuals. 
Yeah. And that doesn't give you as much muscle as if you're a United Airlines with stockholders and that, that you know, and all those, you know, all those connections that they have. So, yeah, it was it was incredibly difficult. And, um, and, and again, don't get me wrong. I'm happy that anybody got love and support from the government and got some recognition and some money. But in the restaurant business, um, we're, you know, the, the restaurant industry is filled with a bunch of, uh, of um, creative adapting, um, facing difficult situations and achieving through them. And, and that's what it really is. You know, I've always said that I'm a jack of all trade and a master of none. We are marketing, we are electricians, we are cooks, we are servers, we are accountants, we're, you know, we're all of it. And so what we watch the industry do, which we do so well, is we learn to pivot. Not everybody made that pivot. You know, not everybody was able to transition to outdoor dining or transition to how to bring in money and uh, how to get their team. So not everybody made it. But fortunately, after two years now, we're coming out of the fog, out of the fire, out of the smoke, and we're starting to see restaurants rebuild and reopen um, and new restaurants come about. But in that time, in that time that we've been through it, there's been a lot of suffering. A lot of people lost. Well, I really wonder how many local mom and pops that had been in business for 20, 25, 30 years because it's such a low margin business. I wonder how many of them closed that never got back open and they just lost everything in two years that they had had for 20, 25 years. Tens of thousands. Is Tens of thousands. Much? Oh, yeah. And, and the thing that's so difficult about it is even those that have come back now, there's been such a, an employment shortage that, you know, I was just having a big staff meeting with my team today and we're opening restaurants around the country. And that's the number one thing is everybody's like, where did everyone go? You know, where, where's, where's the workforce? And so people, it wasn't even, so maybe it wasn't their finances, probably wasn't because of their food, um, you know, because they were already in business before the pandemic happened. Right. A lot of them really came under fire because they just couldn't get staff. Yeah. That's, that's been, that was probably, that's what people don't understand as much as they're like, Oh, why did that place go out of business? It really probably wasn't their finances. I mean, granted you run out of money after a while, some landlords weren't giving some, you know, some consideration to the, you know, to the situation. But so many times when I would check a past triple D joint that we did and say, what happened to them? And people just say, couldn't get staff. Can't get staff, can't pay the bills. Well, I'm wondering what, you and they have found out to be the issue because it appears to me, and listen, I've just talked to people that were in the hospitality business as wait staff or front desk hosts or hostesses that have just straight up said, look, I can make more money staying at home. I don't have to get childcare. I don't have to do the commute. I don't have to have the wardrobe. And it appears to me from a psychological standpoint, we're rewarding bad behavior. We're paying people not to work. Am I wrong or is it more complex than that? I'm sure there are other factors, yeah, I, but that's got to be one yeah. of them. As always, boss, you got your finger on the pulse of America and you're, you, you're reading it. Um, you're seeing the forest through the trees. Um, do not misunderstand me when I say there are people there are single family, you know, single parent families. There are situations that are situations, you know, that right. it does not make financial sense. But there, I think we've just got an abundance of people that are looking at it saying, listen, I don't do anything. I get paid similar amount. I don't have to make the hassle to drive the commute, the thing, this, 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 this. And yeah, I, do I think there's that epidemic? Is it epidemic the right word? Do I think there's that? Do I think there's that problem? Yes, I really do. Uh, I don't have like clinical information to, to explain it, but I do know from enough of my friends and enough of my restaurants that will say to people, where are they? What are they doing? And people are just like, you know, and nobody's waving the flag saying, hey, just so you know, I'm over here doing this. And this is, you know, how I'm getting away with it. No one's getting really loud about it, but there is enough undercurrent, enough undertone with folks that this is really, we've got to figure out how to stop this because we're setting the wrong example. We were just having a conversation the other day about how do kids that went through kindergarten and first grade, never going to school, now acclimate coming into second grade. And the same thing goes with people, these young adults that are coming out of high school that didn't get to finish high school in high school, now get into college, haven't been to the college and haven't, have a, haven't had a job. 
how do we acclimate them into coming into the workforce now? I mean, we've we've had a two year break that if we don't recycle, if we don't recalibrate, if we don't do something, I think we're going to feel this echo, this reverberation of this unemployment, lack of workforce for quite a while. And then what's going to happen? And I think you probably are aware of this. Once this does come full cycle, there's going to be a lot of jobs that people are looking for that there aren't any jobs because people figure out how to replace them with technology or lack of, I mean, restaurants that are going to single surf, you know, going to uh, counter service versus doing full service. And these types of jobs in the restaurant business have been so critical to our workforce in America because they're typically the second job for somebody. So that's given families the opportunity because the adaptability of hours in the restaurant business being from early morning to late night, that people have been able to do their job and then have a second job or have a job on the weekends and, and create that extra income. But I'm worried that this, when the workforce does wake up or the funding is cut back, that they kind of look at it and go, oh, wait a second, why is there no more jobs? Well, because restaurants had to figure out how to do it. I'm glad you mentioned it because there are some people that legitimately are doing something different. There are single moms out there that absolutely the math just doesn't work because of a commute or because they've had to do something else. They're doing what they have to do for their family and for their kids. I get it. But I've also talked to those people that, and it's anecdotal, I acknowledge that, but they're just telling me, look, I, I'm no idiot. I can do the math. I'm getting paid not to work and I'm not going to work. And then they go get some part-time job for cash or whatever, and they're actually making more money and not paying taxes on it. Really, it violates one of the most fundamental principles of psychology, don't reward bad behavior, and we're paying people to not work. And then we say, what's wrong with supply chain? Why can't we get people to come in on the job? Because we're paying them not to. That just drives me crazy. Well, I don't know. I met your son, and I, you know, I remember we had that lunch uh, in Beverly Hills one time. And um, so you've been through this as a parent, but it's you know watching my, my youngest son, Ryder, play basketball. And I remember when he was in little basketball, you know, when he was looking and there was, you know, there were some times that we went and played and there was no score. Yeah. And I'm like, what are we teaching? <laughs> yeah. and, and my thing, do not get me wrong. I hate when my kid loses a game. I hate him crying in the car. Not now. And now he's 16. Um, but I hated that. But you know what it was? Those are the teaching times. That's when we talked about it. Not about blaming the other players or blaming yourself or, or focusing, you know, is we focus on what we can do better. I mean, so when we get into this thing of not, re not participating in the reality, then we start to create, we start to, I, I think the word I used recently was homogenized. We just, we're just pasteurizing everything. And where's, where's the entrepreneurial spirit? Where are we, where are we generating that from? So no, I'm with you a thousand percent. There are instances where people need that support and amen. I think we should do everything we can. We're the strongest country in the world. We should, we should act upon it. But in the same respect, you know, we got to pull the blinders off and be responsible to the fact that we are, we are putting ourselves in a situation where we're, we're, this is going to get, this is going to hurt a lot longer than we think if we keep this up. Yeah. And I'm concerned about what that does when people are out of, as you mentioned, school or out of the workforce for a couple of years, because one of the most comprehensive studies to date has just been released by the National Bureau of Economic Research that was published in the Wall Street Journal just today. And I've actually read the study that the article is about. It was done by authors at the University of Chicago, Casey Mulligan and Stephen Moore and Philip Kirpin of the Committee to Unleash Prosperity. They compare COVID outcomes in 50 states in the District of Columbia, and they looked at three different variables, the economy, education, and the death rate. Basically, what they saw was that the states that locked down everything, shut down the restaurants, locked everybody at home, and compared those to the states that did the least, and there was no difference. They didn't save any lives. All the states did that shut down the economy was ruin the economy. It didn't do anything to save lives. It didn't do anything to help people along. And that study's going to come out soon, 
and people are going to see it. And they just destroyed the economies in the state and it didn't save any more lives than those that left it open so everybody could continue their job, continue their pursuit, and continue their education. Well, I, I think that this type of clinical data is what needs to come to the forefront and we need to pay attention. This is not going to be the last pandemic we face. Um, you know, this is something that's going to, it's going to rear its ugly head again. And I, and, and, and granted, I'm not a politician. I don't run a state. I don't know what it takes, but I do know that we better learn from it because this was really, I mean, there's some, there, there's some suffering that's going to go on for a long time. There's some suffering that went on that you know, it was so difficult for me. I remember the day I found out that California was going to shut down the restaurants and I'm just sitting here looking at my brothers and sisters and, and I have restaurants in California as well. But I'm I'm not insulated, but I have a little bit more threshold than than uh, than some of these mom and pops. And I'm just sitting there looking. I'm going. There's walk-ins full of food. There's bars full of booze. There's taxes that have to be paid. There's team members that are expecting to come to work. There are banquets that are expecting to happen, or and anniversaries that are taking place. And this is all going to get the lights turned off on it like that. What are they going to do with all the food? You know, so many of my my fellow chefs fed their, paid their employees by feeding them, by giving them, here, take this prime rib home. You know, that's all I got for you. Craziness. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I think gives you a really different perspective than a lot of people, because you have restaurants all over the country, you're in and out of them all of the time. You're as hands-on as any manager I've ever seen and as hands-on with your product as I've ever seen. As you move about and talk to your patrons, what's the attitude out there? Are people pessimistic, optimistic, and has it shifted since before the pandemic to now? What are you hearing from your patrons as you talk to them? I have a big restaurant down in Vegas called Guy's Vegas Kitchen and Bar, and uh, kind of the flagship. and I was down there just a couple of weeks ago and they're lying out the door and people are so excited and so happy and so thankful that we're open. Restaurants are far more than just a place to eat. I mean, you can eat at home. You know, you can, you can eat in a, you can you know, eat anywhere. People come out, a restaurant is an engagement. It's an, inter, it's entertainment. It's people watching. It's, it's being serviced. It's, I mean, there's so many facets to why people eat out. And the, the, the guests are overwhelmingly, uh, they're eager. They want in so bad. And the funny thing is, uh, in the restaurant industry, and I can tell you this, the, I can, in, in my history of the restaurant industry, and I've been in it since I was 12, in my history, I've never seen it this upside down in that business is not what we're fighting for. The business is there. Everybody's got business. It's just how do you handle the business because of the workforce. This is mind blowing to us in the industry. We never have seen this. I was just having this with my team today on the call. I said, we're not facing the things that we used to face in the industry of how to get you know, people in the seats. People want to come in the seats. You know, restaurants just can't even have limited seating, not because the government's saying you can't have people in your restaurant. They just don't have the cooks and the servers to do it. Right. They guess one in. They guess one in bad. You mentioned it's more than just the food. And I want to talk about the food here in a minute, but you know, I'm a fan, so I've followed you for a long, long time as a friend, so I'm not pretending to be objective, but one of the things that you've done- Which that never gets old, that never gets old to hear from you, by the way. <laughs> never gets old. I'll listen to that. They called and said, would I be interested? And I said, yes, tonight, tomorrow, right now. Will you tell me when the boss wants me? <laughs> yeah. So thank you. You know, yeah. And you know, the, the admiration is mutual. Well, thank you. The thing I'm talking about is, you said you've been in this since you're 12, and- one of the things that you've always done is you've created an experience. It's not just somebody comes in, gets their food, sits down, eats it, pays, goes home. Every restaurant you've ever opened, it's always been a dining experience of some sort. You've created themes, something that people immerse themselves in when they come in. What drove you and gave you that insight and understanding from the very beginning? Because you've done it from the very, very beginning. I've asked, been asked a lot of questions. I've never had it asked that way. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you what my quick answer is. And usually that gut answer is the one. 
I grew up, I, I grew up, I didn't have, my family didn't have a lot of money. I grew up in a little town called Ferndale up in Northern California. If you ever saw the movie Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman, uh, that was filmed in this little town called Ferndale. I was just there yesterday doing a, doing a fundraiser for our local museum. Um, so we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't eat out a lot. We weren't poor by any means. My parents were very smart with their money, pri private business owners. So when we went out to eat, eating was an experience. It was something that we looked forward to. We, we, we talked about we were going to go do it. I was eating crazy food when I was a young kid. My parents were hippies. So we would, I mean, I was eating sushi when I was like seven and eight years old. And I mean, in Northern California, eating sushi in the mid seventies was not a normal, normal thing. But the point was, is dining out was an experience, something you looked forward to. And I always said when I made my restaurants that it wasn't going to be just about the food. The service had to be great. The environment had to set the tone. The uh, music had to back up the environment. That had to all equal to the experience of what the food was. And the service had to circle it all around and complement it together. And I, and I felt that when you have somebody that's coming, and this is how I explain it to my teams every time, when they're coming to entrust in you, and again, this was part of my mentality as a, as a kid coming from not having a lot of money, they're going to entrust in you that this party of four, this family of four is coming in to have their dinner. That may be their one dinner for the month that they're getting to have out. Let's make sure we do everything within our power to make sure that they get the full experience from the way they're greeted at the front door to the cleanliness of the parking lot when they drive in. And it, and it echoes all the way through. And I tell them about clean restrooms. Nothing, nothing sets you off worse than going to a restaurant than restrooms. Are, you know, just all these components. And when I started to ask my teens to have that vision of being responsible to take care of these people that are trusting you to give them the experience, people saw it a different way. It wasn't just let's put food on a plate and put it in front of them. Yeah, and even the names that you put on <laughs> your restaurants and some of the dishes you serve, like trash can nachos and uh, Guy Fieri's dive bar and taco joint. You've got Guy's Pig and Anchor on Carnival Cruise Lines. How do you come up with this? Because people find it fun. They find it charming. They want to talk about it when they leave. Well, that that, that uh, partnership that I have with Carnival Cruise Lines is an amazing one. And you you go on Carnival Cruise Lines to have a blast. You go to forget everything at home. You get to come out there and it's 24-7. And they give you a great ship. They give you great rooms. They give you great entertainment. And what does everybody really seek the most? They seek great food. And so when we came, when I think about things, I want the name to come out of your mouth, as you just said, when you said trash can nachos. Yeah. I like that there's a little chuckle. You can't say trash can and then say nachos and not have a little juxtaposition to you know tilt your head. But once you have them, once you have the experience and you see why we call them trash can nachos and not being afraid to do it that way. You know, I'm not a classically trained chef. I've, I've worked, I've cooked all my life. Uh, I never went to school for this. Some people went to school, some people didn't. I don't think you have to go to school to be great in any industry. Um, I think you just have to be committed to it and passionate about it. And I have license to do crazy things like call things trash can nachos or pig and anchor. It's a barbecue joint on a ship. Yeah. We're serving pig and the ship's got an anchor. <laughs> yeah. I thought it worked. Yeah, it does work, right? Did you ever see the one, Phil? Did you ever see the one called Tex Wasabis? No. Tex, Tex Wasabis. That this was, I mean, I've opened, let's see, I've got 87 restaurants now. But this was one of my, this is like my fourth restaurant that I opened in my career. It was called Tex Wasabi's Southern Style Barbecue. So low and slow barbecue and sushi together. And everybody told me, you are crazy. There's no way this is going to work. And I said, barbecue restaurants don't typically get put in the environment that have really nice service and really, you know, it's usually sawdust on the floor and it's a little bit more, you know, it's a little bit more down yeah. and dirty. And sushi restaurants are typically so cultural that they, you know, that if you don't understand the culture of sushi and you're not a sushi person, and my wife didn't like sushi, but she loved barbecue. I said, I, I love sushi. I love barbecue. I'm going to put the two of them together. People looked at me like I had four heads. There's nobody that is that crazy to do it. And I'm telling you, we did it and it crushed for years for, I don't know, we had it like 15 years. It was, uh, it was one of the highlights. Yeah. And your first restaurant was when did you open your first restaurant? Was that in 96? Was that Johnny Garlic's in 96? Yeah. 
Yeah, Johnny Garlics was in 96. And, and the reason we did, and we called it Johnny Garlics, my business partner at the time, his son's name was Jonathan. And, you know, being of Italian descent, we don't call anybody Jonathan, we call him Johnny. And garlic is in every ethnicity of food. I mean, almost everybody uses garlic and garlic's in ketchup. And we thought here was a great way to, because I wanted to have a menu that didn't have any boundaries. I wanted to open up a menu that just said, if I want to do a little Asian, I can. If I want to do a little barbecue, I can. If I want to do a little uh, Italian, I can. And in 96, coming here to the wine country, you would have thought that, again, I had four heads. Um, because Well, you were a, 18. Was pretty, uh, no, I was 20, what was I, 23, 24? I was pretty young. I was yeah, pretty young. You My wife young. and I were pregnant. We were, we were pregnant with our first son, and I was down in L.A. doing restaurants, and I just – I loved LA and the restaurant scene was awesome, but I knew that I would only be a little fish in a big pond and I wanted to have a chance to make an impact in my community. I'm, I'm, I'm big about philanthropy. So I wanted to make sure that I had a chance to go to a community where I could make an impact. How did you wind up on TV the first time? You ever seen cops? Oh yeah. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you were the guy on the end of the bed with the t-shirt on, right? Who the looked guy, up yeah. and didn't seem surprised that the cops were in your bedroom. Exactly. And then I gave him a whole big story. Um, so I was, uh, it, it's funny because um, there was a guy, there was a, there's a hot rod uh, muffler company called Flowmaster. And uh, they're in our town here in Santa Rosa. Oh, really? I got Flowmaster 48s on my 57 Chevy. Th then you know it. You, na you know it. So there was a guy named, um, uh, there, was, there was a guy that used to come in and, um, and come to my restaurant all the time. And he would say to me all the time, and he's Australian guy, he'd, he'd say, you really need, uh, you need to be on television. And we'd laugh about it. And I would make my commercial, my restaurant on the local cable network. Cause I would trade the cable TV owner guy for, for dinners in the restaurant. And you know, it's small little community. And that was it. My aunts always used to tell me my, my aunts at family reunions would tell me, Oh, you got to be on TV. You're so funny. That went on and on and on. And, I never took it seriously. All I wanted to be was a cook. All I wanted to do was own restaurants. And uh, a couple of my buddies, there was a show on the Food Network called the Food Network Star, next Food Network Star. And I didn't watch TV. I really, I'm really not a big TV guy. Um, and not because I don't think TV is great. It's just I work so much that when I come home, I'm typically, you know, going to sleep. And uh, they all told me about this show called the Food Network Star. And I never watched it. I didn't even see, I didn't even know what the Food Network was. I said, who watches a, a show all that? I said, now, you know, the Galloping Gourmet and Julia Childs, I'll watch that. But that was PBS back when I was a kid. Well, long story short, I, 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 they talked me into signing up to send in the video to this show. And, uh, and they pick it. And I go on the show. And I got there the day we started to do the show. And I look at everybody. They're all buttoned up in their chef coats. And <laughs> I'm standing there in a cutoff T-shirt and a leather jacket. And I'm like, this ain't going to go well. Well, I ended up winning. And the rest was kind of history. Yeah, well, you got awarded your own series, which was Guy's Big Bite, right? Right. That was the first one. That was the first one. And uh, then they gave me another show uh, called Gotta Get It. And I shot the pilot for it. I didn't know anything about TV. I mean, I, I became a student of TV real fast. Now I produce nine shows and, you know, host four of them. And, you know, now I went, I mean, I think just kind of like you do, you take what you do. And then if you're going to immerse yourself into it, you got to know the 360. So now I'm a whole different space. But back then I went and did this show called Gotta Get It. And uh, I, I shot the pilot for it and I did my part and it got picked up for 13 episodes. And they called, they said, congratulations, you got a primetime show. Uh, it's called Gotta Get It. I'm like, oh, hey, um, I don't want to do that show. They're like what? I'm like, no, nah, that's I, I did the pilot, you know, but I know that that meant it's had to go to a show. Yeah, I, I can't do that show. Like, what do you mean you can't do the show? Well, it went through about six levels of people through the Food Network and this production company. Everybody just read me the riot act of me wasting everybody's time. I said, I just got to be real. And finally to the president of the network, I said, let me just share something with you. I said, I'm 35 years old. I own four restaurants. I got two kids. I said, uh, anything that I'm going to apply my time and energy to, I got to really believe in. And I don't believe in the show. And Brooke Johnson was our president. And she said, you're turning down. You, why did you come to the network? Why did you? I said, I want to see what it was like. I said, I'll do another show. I just want to do this one. That was the thing. And you know, the power in the no in the industry, oh, yeah. you got to be, you got to be willing, you got to stand on the ground. That could have been, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. And I wasn't trying to be an egomaniac or anything. It just was a show about gadgets in the kitchen. I'm not a gadget chef. 
I don't do that stuff. I'm a knife and cutting board and saute pan guy. And I didn't need an avocado peeler. Yeah. And that six months was the longest six months of sitting around. And they called me one day and they said, okay, we got another show. What would you think about a show that went around and checked out mom and pop restaurants in the country? And I said, that's my kind of show. Yeah. You know, highlight, highlighting my brothers and sisters. They said, okay, it's called Drivers, Diners, Divins, and Divers. I go, I couldn't say the name for the longest time. I could, that's why we call it Triple D all the time. Yeah. I said, what's it called? Diners, Drivins, and Dives? That's my kind of thing. And that's how it got started. Yeah, well, that's been on for how long now? That was that started in 06. Two decades, I think. Yeah. It feels feels like 10 decades. No, it yeah. it has been. We we we're almost getting ready for it's three epi- three locations per episode, and we're just getting ready to hit our 500th episode. Wow. So we've been, yeah, we've been doing it a while and it's, it's amazing what it does. It's, it's, we call it the restaurant lottery, you know, and it's not me. I tell people all the time, please, please do not. I'm just the portal. I'm just the guy that gets you there. These places are there. These mom and pop joints are there. They're these uh, amazing places around our country. We're the you know, greatest country in the world. Just get off of the beaten path that you see all the chain restaurants on with all their big signs. Go to the street two rows over. And the one that's got the plywood sign, you yeah. know, where there's 25 cars in front of, go check that joint out. Yeah. So what happens when a place gets picked for triple D and they get on and get highlighted? What's the impact? It's, I mean, it really has to do with three factors. It has to do with how's the food, how's the story and how's the character. Yeah. Um, sometimes the character is amazing. The food's simple. The story's good. Um, you know, every five, there'll be somebody hits the trifecta where just each one of them is just boom, boom, boom out of the park. People love to tell me all the time. I know when you like something and when you hate something, when you love something, I said, well, you'll never see anything that I hate on the show. I I don't, I'm not going to sell you a bag of beans. I won't lie to you. I tell you just the way it is. I'm not a food critic. I'm just a cook. And I'm just a guy that's tasting it and telling you what's, what goes out of my mind is what comes out of my mouth. I'm not playing a game with you, but we've had in the, in the hundreds of places that have opened multiple locations franchised. Really? Oh, I, I can share stories with you about the stories of people just writing. So, you know, we were, we were at our last paycheck. We were, we were more, we had mortgaged our home. Our, our kids weren't going to go to college. Our, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And like, you you saved us. And I'm like, you know what? I really appreciate you think I did. I didn't say you were already doing what you're doing. All I did was shine the light on you. And you do that with so many people's lives and careers and family settings and so yeah, forth. Sure. You know, it's it's it, these things exist. I just happen to be the guy that gets a chance to show it to you. And it's just overwhelming. Um, but I love, you know, people ask me, what, you know, are you still happy doing the show? I said, no, again, don't get me wrong. I'm tired. You know, 15 years on the road shooting a show is a long time, but uh, knowing what it does for my brothers and sisters in the business, and I know how hard it is in the business, having had my own, you know, individual restaurants, it's, it's kind of like, I can't turn it off. It's too important to, to the well-being. Yeah. Cause it's hard to rise above the noise. And when one of them really pops, it really changes their lives. I mean, like, I mean, I'm telling you. I, the stories are just overwhelming. And I'll go back and I'll see these people and they'll tell me where their lives have gone. You know, we do a new show, not a new show. It's been going on for about five or six years now called Triple D Nation. And where we go back to the restaurants and visit them and they tell us the stories about how after the show aired, what happened. And even when a restaurant just doubles itself, I mean, you're now you're, I mean, it's not exactly double the income. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but wow, what an opportunity that people take it. And I tell them all the time, when I leave here, please make sure that your game is tight because when the triple D fans show up, they will show up like it's, you know, like it's free concert tickets. They are showing up for the party and you need to be ready for them. And, uh, and most of these folks really handle it and handle it right. And, uh, and amen. I'm so happy for them. Yeah. Now, talk about this Flavor Town Kitchen. You've got 175 locations. How does this work? Okay. So 
So when the pandemic was hitting, we knew that there were so many restaurants that had teams working, but couldn't serve all the food because the restaurants were closed or they were open, but they were just open in a few seats outside, but they were doing delivery and to go. Well, you can't do enough delivery and to go to keep everybody working. Right. So my thing was it went to these restaurants and partnered up and said, okay, here's the deal. Here's, you know, 10 items that we make in the Guy Fieri style restaurants. And we'll teach you how to do it and give you all the recipes. We'll create all the packaging. We'll come and train you. And then we'll make these available for delivery and to go because delivery and to go is what was prevailing, um, which is still a crazy thing to me because it's, you know, in some situations, the delivery fees more than the food is. Yeah. But people, people become accustomed to this. People really like this, you know, about getting the food brought to them and not having to go to the restaurant. So uh, we started, oh, and Flavor Town is my brand, and it's, you know, been a word I've used forever. And, and we started doing it. And the great thing was, is, you know, I've got, what, 87 restaurants, and, but I don't have them in every city and every part of the country. But we were able to find small restaurants that needed some support. And we could go in and they get to sell it. We take a percentage. They keep their, you know, so they've got their guy cooking pasta dishes for their restaurant concept and making trash can nachos for ours. Right on. Yeah. They don't have to have the infrastructure. They don't have to have all the staff. So it works. It's a, it's a win. It's a win win. It keeps them working, helps, put, helps pay the bills. Um, some are super successful. You know, do a few thousand dollars a day. Some are mildly successful, only do a couple hundred bucks a day. But the for us, we looked at it as it was a way to it was a way to reach the fan base. It was a way to inject some energy into some concepts that maybe weren't getting all the business volume that they needed, um, and help, like I said, help pay the bills. Um, and it is a trend. Not, I don't even want to say it's a trend; it's a future that we're seeing in. Um, in restaurants that not all restaurant operators can afford the the rent for a high rent district area, the tables, the chairs, the service, and so forth. But people still want their food. So they can now have maybe three or four cooks and a manager generating the same volume of food that they would if they had a full dining room and two bartenders and six servers. So it, there, there is a future in this. There clearly is. Now, you've also gotten into the winery business. I started this long time ago. I started this uh, over 10 years ago and you can't live here in the wine country and well, I'm a big wine fan, but you can't live here in the wine country and not want to be in the, in the wine business. And so we'd bought a parcel of land, uh, seven acres and had this amazing Pinot on it. And we started making Pinot and we were going to build a little winery and have a tasting room and all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately I got trapped up in the, in the NIMBY attitude of a neighborhood that, uh, wasn't going to allow that winery to get built. And uh, I didn't have time or didn't have the time and energy to fight it. So we still made the wine and then we just did the wine on the internet and did the wine to our restaurants and, and so forth. And, and the wine, and it's, it's the little engine that could, you know, there's so many amazing, amazing wines in the world today. Uh, but we have a great winemaker guy names his guy, his name happens to be guy, guy Davis. And, um, and so we are now, you know, we make uh, three varietals and, we do it. And then, we, and then while I'm doing that, I also have a tequila company with my buddy, Sammy Hagar. We have a tequila company called Santo Tequila. So Sammy and I are the, uh, are the, are the split partners on that, that we do this tequila. That's just amazing. I don't know if you're a tequila drinker. If you are, I got to send you some because it is lights out. And the, the Blanco was rated the top, uh, the top 20 Blanco tequilas in the world by the Rob report. Um, so we do a Blanco, we do a Reposado, our Añejo is just getting ready to come out. So yeah, I, I, I have, I have my, my hand in a few different projects. I love projects. It keeps me busy, keeps me focused. Robin is a huge tequila fan. So are Jay and Jordan. So you got to send it's, me some. It's, it's a done deal. It's, it's a, it's, I should have sent it to you ahead of time. This conversation would have been really out of control. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So while I'm asking you about all these things, you got to tell us about your foundation because you're doing some amazing things. Your rescue trailer, you've served over 120,000 meals in relief at natural disasters like the Tubbs fire, the campfire and car fire, the Kincaid fire, 120,000 meals. You should really be proud of that. Well, I appreciate it. And, uh, 
you know, I think just as you do, you're, you're concerned about your community and concerned about the, the well-being of people. And you can't always wait for those situations to, to invite you to come help them. You got to sometimes put yourself into them. So when we had the first big fires up here and it burned about a mile, not even a mile, about a block from my house and we evacuated and everything was crazy. And I was, uh, I had to leave that morning after the fire. And we didn't even know the level of the devastation that had happened here in the town of Santa Rosa. And I had to fly down to do a, do a charity event um, down in Texas. And so as I landed to do the charity event, my dad called me and said, man, you know, it was because I left early. He says, it's bad. He says, uh, when you get a chance, you need to come home. So I finished up the charity event, flew home. And as I was flying home, I called my guys and I said, you know, I hear there's much people living at the gymnasiums. <clears throat> I mean, it, it burned down half the, half the town. I said, what are they eating? So I called my buddy who works for Salvation Army. And he said, yeah, we're feeding them uh, uncrustable sandwiches and cold hot dogs. And I said, how many people are we talk about? He says, there's about 5,000 people. So I called oh, all my chefs, nice. all my guys that work in my team. And I said, fire up the smokers because I have a bunch of restaurant equipment. I, I mean, I, I cook everything. And I said, fire up the smokers. I'm going to get home. We're going to start feeding people. So we just drove into the parking lot unannounced. Just drove in with these big smokers, set up tables, started cooking food, and just started serving food to people. And everybody's like, where's this coming from? I said, we're just here to feed. And just, I mean, like, I mean, it was the only game in town. Everything, the whole town was shut down. There's no power in the town. So we yeah. started feeding people. And fortunately, about three days later, some friends of ours from a group called OBR, Operation Barbecue Relief, showed up. And they have a big swing. They know a lot of folks. And so they brought in a bunch of people. And then we were feeding by the you know, tens of thousands. Well, it gave me a thought. And it's and, and, and that w next week, I said, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a governed body that has any rules to follow. And I can afford to pay for this myself. I'm just going to create my own rescue team that when shit goes down, I can handle it. Right. So I went and built, I built a trailer. cost me $400,000. Um, and I got some great donations to for equipment. We got a Freightliner gave us a big Freightliner truck to haul it with because it's 48 feet long. It's massive. And we can feed anywhere from five to 10,000 people out of this trailer. And when the fires happen, we could just deploy. So we started doing that. And that was great. We were able to help. We cooked 15. We took uh, cooked Thanksgiving dinner for 15,000 uh, up at the Paradise Fire. But you know what it was is after that, we started saying, well, we don't have to be there first because you know what happens sometimes is when people are on these fires for 30 or 40 days, they get pretty burned out. So what yeah. we started to do is coming in as a health and welfare. We started coming in as a positive to kind of what they, as they will say, break the clock, like resetting the clock for them because it's been the same monotonous situation. And all of a sudden here comes Guy Fieri and his buddies and chefs from all over the country. And they're cooking us barbecue and making macaroni you know they're making pot they're making uh, uh mac and cheese with bacon on it they're yeah. you know hawaiian rolls and all this kind of stuff and so it's really turned into a, an amazing program and then when we realized that when the fires weren't happening now i still have all these resources of all these volunteers um we have the trailer so now what we do is when we don't have disasters we go around uh, and feed veterans and feed first responders. So we were just in New Jersey uh, two weeks ago. We fed 1,200 veterans in New Jersey. We went to two different VFWs, put on two separate luncheons, one on Friday, one on Saturday, and just invited VF, just invited veterans and their families. Just come down. We're going to feed you, feed you for free and just to say thank you. So we do that, and then we go to these first responder camps, um, like the CHP and the sheriff and the you know the, the fire departments. And just say, hey, everybody in this area of Solano, you know, or Napa, whatever, this day we're going to be here in this parking lot. Come on down. We'd love to feed you guys. So we just try to do positive welfare things. But on top of that, we have a reading advocacy program for kids in, you know, low income schools. We have uh, we have a variety of packages of things that we try to do. But I can't be given this opportunity. I can't have this opportunity that I've had in my career and not take it and do something with it because otherwise I think I'd be wasting so much of the energy that comes along with, it. you know, I gotta, I gotta make sure that I share with people and, and shine the light. I get all the light show, you know, on me. And I know you do the same thing. I just try to divert as much as I can to like, Hey, let's look over here, but we've gotten some great sponsors and some great donors. And 
Uh, we give out a lot of scholarships. We do a lot of culinary schools, and we got a, we got a lot going on. Yeah, well, you know, when you were talking about Triple D, and I was saying, what's the impact when one of them gets on the show? You said, well, it depends. If there's a great character, and there's great food, and there's a great story, then it really turns out well. And that's what's so much fun talking to you about all of this, because you make great food, you're a great character, and you sure have a great story. And Uh, it's no accident that you are the most famous person in the food business, (laughs) the food industry, the restaurant business in the entire country and have been for a long time because you fit the triple D formula. It works for them. It works for you. So there you go. What goes around comes around, right? I've never heard anybody ever spin that back on me. I'm just yeah. telling you, only you. You're the one that sees, <laughs> you know, you have that that 30,000 foot view on things. So of course you would turn that right back on me. But no, I I, I can see what you're saying with it. And it, it is, it's, it's so ironic that you would, that you would pick up on it and go, but um, no, being, being raised with good parents and in a great community and uh, staying grounded and staying. And I remember when you and I first met, you said, how did you end up this way? I, you know, I told you that story about my mom and dad and yeah. what great people I was just up in that little town Ferndale. And so the museum wrote me and said, um, could you write the Ford for our, our community cookbook? We're going to make a cookbook with all the history of Ferndale. And I said, yeah. And I said, how many books are you going to sell? I said, we're going to sell a hundred. I said, that's all you can sell. And they said, no, we're going to, we're going to sell a thousand, but we just don't have any money. I said, how much are the cookbooks? They said, 10 bucks a piece. I said, all right, I'll buy all the cookbooks, 10,000 bucks. I'll, I'll pay for them. I'll write the four and I'll pay for the $10,000. And I said, but you have to sell the cookbooks for 40 bucks a piece. And they said, great. So we just sold all the cookbooks, made $40,000 to the museum, which is their annual budget. Yeah. And People like, and everybody's like, that's, and it's not where I come from, where I come from our community rallies like that. And I tell people this all the time. We can make a bigger difference in this world. You just have to move your, you just got to move your skew, maybe 10% more. Maybe it's not financial. Maybe it's participation. Maybe it's uh, advocacy. Maybe it's just vocal, being vocal, but who knows what it is. But if we just moved at 10%, I think we could fix a lot of these issues, these social issues that we have in our country uh, and could make this a lot better place, but we're not going to do a bitching about it. You know, we're going to have to really activate and participate one way or another, some form, shape or form, do something. But we, we all, we are empowered. We're the greatest country in the world. We, we brought ourselves from nothing a few different times and saved and, and turned this, uh, this right of this ship. Um, I really hope we get this straight. And I, you know, you're, uh, you're such a patriot and such a leader of the country. I, I, uh, I look forward to seeing how you continue to help us see the vision on this because it's, uh, it's, it's ours to lose folks, you know? Well, it is. And you're a perfect example of, like you say, you don't have to have a bunch of money to give a million dollars to a cause. If what you have to give is your time, what you have to give, I mean, maybe a little bit of this or a little bit of that. Robin and I work in the foster care system and the court-appointed special advocates that help kids in the system when they have to go into court and stuff. And she got involved and raised $100 million in volunteer services for CASA in a year just by people saying, hey, I don't have a lot of money, but I've got some time. Find a way. Everybody is complaining and there's so much divisiveness if you took just a little bit of that energy, like you say, and said, you know, what can I do? And you don't have to be organized. Hell, you drive by and see your truck out there, walk up and say, hey, can I serve? You know, give me a spoon. I'll put some beans on a plate. What? Just anything. We just need to take start. A, take a picture. Take a picture and make positive affirmations on social media and talk about something good people are doing in this world versus getting all negative and down. We got enough negative energy floating around out there. Let's counterbalance it with positive energy. You know how many good things that we have going on in our community that doesn't make the front page of the paper because sensationalism doesn't, you know, the sensationalism yeah. sells. So I'm, I'm with you. And, uh, and please keep in mind that I'm always good. You know, I, we play inside of our, uh, you know, inside of our fields of things that we do, but I'm a, I'm a huge fan of kids and family 
and uh, and children really are the future. So you keep in mind when you guys do another fundraiser, how I can lend my support on that and either send some items or send a, a, a visit to Triple D or something and let me know how I can lean on your uh, lean in on your project as well. I'd, I'd love to. I try to I try to make sure that that's something I'm always involved in. Well, you're great to say that, and I'll take you up on it for sure. Look, congratulations on all your success. You know I've been a huge fan forever. Jay and Robin send their regards, by the way. Jay, I told him I was talking to you, and he said to say, hey, listen, continued success, and thank you so much for everything you've done for so many people, particularly during the pandemic, but before and after, certainly for the first responders and the vets and all. I look forward to seeing you soon. I'll show up in one of your restaurants. You can put the feedback on me, and I'll hit him a big lick. Well, anytime, my friend. And, and again, thank you for the invite to be here. I was, uh, I'm so excited. And, you know, we've, we've talked about this since we've known each other about getting a project together and one day we can do something. So I know they'll be calling you for a telethon or me for a something or another, but we, any chance I get to work with you, it would be an honor. And, uh, and again, thank you for setting such a great example. I told you this when I met you and Jay and we talked that day, I said, you, you've been just a great mentor and, and somebody that I really take the lead on and what you see is what you get. Uh, and you are the genuine article. So all, all those compliments coming from you just mean the world. So thank well, you so much. And and tequila will be, do you still have your same cell, I assume? Oh, yeah. All the same I, digits. I, I got the same one, too. Um, I'll send you a text and uh, send or have someone send Natalie an address. And uh, and tequila will be uh, on on its way. I'm holding you to it. I'm, I'm just asking for pictures of pictures of party. And that's all I want to say. Oh, you'll get those. That's for sure. Guy, thanks so much. I'll see you soon, man. You're awesome, boss. Thanks for having me. Take care. All right, bye. Take care.